again, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for our first virtual Rebel Recharge Lecture. We are very pleased so many of you have chosen to be with us as we have shifted our traditional face-to-face -face programming formats to a virtual format in an effort to continue to inform and engage our alumni community in these current times. My name is Stacy Purcell. I'm the president of the UNLV Alumni Association, and it is my honor to personally welcome each of you here today. I would like to also give special recognition and welcome to Regent Laura Perkins from the Nevada System of Higher Education, Blake Douglas, Interim Associate Vice President for Alumni Engagement and Executive Director of the UNLV Alumni Association. And in addition, I'd like to thank Renee rivera Gelfi, for our coordinator for programming and events for producing today's virtual lecture. Our next virtu virtual Rebel Recharge is scheduled for Friday, June 12th, and the topic is climate change, what it means for our planet, our state, and our community, presented by research professor, Dr. Kristen Everett from the Office of the Executive Vice President and Provost. Please visit our website engage.unlv slash event for more information on upcoming topics. Our goal is to continue to grow this program and create opportunities to engage with our alumni, faculty, staff, students, and community members. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the speaker for today's program, Dr. David Schwartz the Associate Vice Provost for Faculty Affairs and Professor at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Dr. Schwartz studies gambling and casinos, video games, Las Vegas, tourism, and higher education, all the fun stuff. He has written several books, including Grandissimo, The First Emperor of Las Vegas, Roll the Bones, The History of Gambling, Boardwalk Playground, The Making, Unmaking, and remaking of Atlantic City. We are excited that he is here with us today to share his passion and perspective for how Las Vegas can come back. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David Schwartz. Thank you so much, Stacy. I really appreciate it. And I want to thank Renee and Mitch and Robert and Blake and everybody who helped set this up. This is really great. As you can see, the talk today is how Las Vegas can come back. And this is just to look at a little bit of where we've been, where we are, and where we can go next. Okay. So I'll three things with you pretty quickly. What was Las Vegas? What made Las what made the Las Vegas that we were living in up until March? What is Las Vegas now as we speak on May 15th? And what can Las Vegas be? What was Las Vegas? Here we have a picture of the strip at the height of its glory, filled with people, filled with cars. Okay, so Las Vegas started out, and the history will be very short, don't worry, started out in the 1850s as a Mormon settlement and as a ranch. Later in 1905, a town was founded by the railroad. And luckily enough today, by it's just an incredible coincidence, today is the 115th birthday of Las Vegas. Las Vegas was founded with the land auction back in 1905. So it's kind of a nice coincidence that that's happening today. And the interesting thing about Las Vegas, having worked in the special collections and archives in Lead Library, I've you know really gotten to get into the history. And if you look back at the old newspapers from the 1920s, they were talking about Las Vegas being an agricultural center and they were going to do irrigation projects to have farmers move here. Then they were talking about they were going to have businesses relocate here and manufacturing. In the 1930s, after Hoover Dam was built and after gaming was re-legalized and divorce was made a little bit more easy, that's when Las Vegas started to pivot towards gambling and tourism as being a big part of the economy. And it really took another 20 years for Las Vegas to be known as a place where you would go to gamble or to vacation. Before that, it was pretty much the place you went on the way to Hoover Dam. So it took about 20 years. And if you look at the history of Las Vegas in Nevada, it really only got that buy-in from power brokers after everything else didn't pan out. So the agricultural didn't really work. The manufacturing didn't, and they kind of moved into tourism in that way. But there was nothing, you know, for the first almost half of Las Vegas's life, 
it really wasn't trying to be a tourist mecca. And just a little bit of a historical curiosity, 1952 was the first time that the words Las Vegas Strip appear in print. So I kind of date that to the start of Las Vegas as a real tourism mecca. So the thing about living in the desert is you have to adapt and the conditions can be very harsh. And Las Vegas has been like that. Las Vegas has been a very adaptable city. You know, many cities have their identity and they're still doing the same thing hundreds of years later. You know, if you look at Venice, Venice is Venice. It's been Venice for a thousand years and it will continue to be Venice. Las Vegas is different. It's changing all the time. So for example, I talked about how it was founded by the railroad. After a labor strike in the early 1920s, the railroad closed the shops, which devastated the town economically. And Las Vegas started to say, well, what can we be besides a railroad town? They discovered that in the 30s, which I talked about, the Hoover Dam, gaming, the divorce bill, which meant you only had to live in, in Nevada for six weeks to get a no-fault divorce. So that started in the 30s. Then in the 40s, during World War II, the city found its identity as a patriotic place that supported the war effort. You know, in addition to having a lot of war bond drives, like every community in America did, Las Vegas hosted Basic Magnesium and the Gunnery School, which eventually became Nellis. So even if you were just working in a hotel in Las Vegas or working in a pharmacy, you could say with pride, well, yeah, people in my area contributed to the war. We did the stuff with Basic Magnesium and the fuses and the bombs, and thanks to us, we're winning the war. Casinos become the big thing in the 1950s and that, you know, some of the books that Stacy was kind enough to mention that I've written talk a lot about that. But I found something really interesting as I was thinking about how Las Vegas adapts and what its purpose is. I went back to the Cold War when Las Vegas really stepped up as having a meaning in life and something that it contributed to the rest of the country. And that was the atomic test site which was seen as the front line in the war against communism, the front line for defense of the United States. Initially, when they first said, we wanna blow up nuclear weapons within sight of your home, as you can understand, people were pretty hesitant. Nobody said this is a great idea, but when it happened and there was no calamity, they embraced it. And it's kind of funny because they did the first round of tests were in the spring of 1951. In the fall of 1951, they did the second round, and these were lower yield weapons that they were testing. People actually complained that the explosions weren't big enough, that the tourists were gonna to be dis disappointed, and couldn't the government do a little bit better and really put on a show? So it became part of the identity of Las Vegas. And if you were from Las Vegas, you could take pride in saying, yes, we are helping protect our country. And this lasted until the 80s. And it's interesting because just as the test site is receding from the public consciousness, UNLV provides a real sort of voice to the community, a place for people to rally with the running rebels. And I don't have to remind those of you who were here in those years what a big deal this was. So the running rebels were at that identity in the 80s. Then just as the running rebels dynasty is on its way out, Las Vegas becomes known as a place for casino resorts and becomes really the global capital of casino resorts, where Las Vegas can say that it is better at hospitality and better at this than anyone else in the world. And all the old school hospitality education programs have to look at Las Vegas now because we're doing this in a scale that nobody else is. So Las Vegas in the 90s reinvents itself as the most connected city in the world. And there's a great story I've been told by Henry Gluck, who was the chairman of Caesars, who was driving, driving in a cab in Nairobi, Kenya. And the cab driver didn't speak English, but the cab driver somehow asked him where he, what he was from, what he did. And he said, La, you know, Las Vegas, Caesars Palace. And the cab driver said, oh, Caesars Palace and held up his hands like boxing gloves. So in other words, Caesars in Las Vegas had this global identity where a cab driver in Nairobi not only knows about Las Vegas, but knows about individual casinos there. And that's pretty incredible. That's pretty, pretty incredible. There's a lot of really important businesses all over the country, but they don't have that kind of recognition. And that's unique. 
And the idea of Las Vegas, as it's been for the past 30 years, is that this is the city, this is the place, the one place on earth where you have people coming, you have different kinds of cuisine, you have different kinds of entertainment, and of course, gambling, and you do it all here. And this is really where the city hits its mark. This is where the city is becoming really a global destination. But it's more fragile and more dependent on this than it ever has been. So when the gaming industry, when hospitality was maybe 10 million people a year and 40% of them were driving up from California, that was a very different situation from when you have 42 million people a year and the bulk of them are flying in. And it is higher profile, it's more lucrative, but it's a lot more fragile as we can now see. So that's where, how Las Vegas got here. Now slide for our second part, what is Las Vegas? And this seemed like the best encapsulation of where we are now. Well, well, there's still people here. Some of them are wearing what look like military grade gas masks. And we don't see that same volume that we saw once. So the question that I'm wondering is what happens to the most connected city in the world when everybody cuts their connections? And I would just sum it up as one word, despair. And I think that is a natural reaction. You know, some people might sort of go through those stages of grief where you start by denial and say, well, no, there's no problem. As soon as people are able to fly, it's going to be great. Well, I don't know. It's pretty serious. So despair is a natural reaction because the identity we've had for 30 years has been taken away. And no one really prepared for this. You know, I don't think that this was on anybody's radar. We had had a lot of crises before, 9-11, the Great Recession, the October 1st shootings, but nothing this bad. So nobody was prepared for anything this bad. And it's not just a slowdown like we saw in the past, but a total halt to the economy. And it's difficult to see what the purpose of Las Vegas is. You know, if we have 150,000 hotel rooms, but people aren't flying, what are we supposed to do? So Connected Vegas was built in a couple things. Fast and easy travel. You know, where you get on a plane in London, and this is one of the things I marvel at. You get on a plane in London, and if you're a deep enough sleeper, you wake up in Vegas. Or you watch some in-flight movies and stuff like that and end up in Vegas. And that is just a luxury I don't think any of us really appreciated. It's also built on low anxiety and people being comfortable in crowds. It's also built in relatively high levels of wealth, people being able to come here and expend, and spend money on all the great things that we provide. And like I said before, crowds, lots of people. You know, the great thing about Las Vegas is you have the nightclubs and all that stuff, so that's a lot. And my question is, when can we expect these to return? I don't know the answer. That would be Brian Labus or some of our great folks in epidemiology and viro virology. Be great if I could say it, who could tell us more about that. So it's more of a rhetorical question than one that I have the answer for. So here's the thing with Las Vegas. In February 2020, we could look back with some pride and say, when we built it, they came. We built all the stuff in the middle of the desert, and 42 million people a year came here. But if we reopen, will they come back? Can we? bank on having that many people coming to Las Vegas and tourism driving the economy in the way it did. Well, there's a couple concerns. There's medical concerns. People are worried about getting sick or spreading disease. There's also travel restrictions. Other countries may have travel restrictions where international guests can't come here. And for Americans, there's a lack of discretionary income. So people who may want to come to Las Vegas and may not be afraid might not have the money because they have lost their jobs. Historically, gaming in Nevada tracks very well and core very well with high consumer confidence and low unemployment. As you can imagine, right, right now, those numbers are flipped. So this does not look good. People say diversification is important. Since the 1920s, again, going back to the 1920s, we can read in the local newspapers, the Las Vegas Age, which is available through uh, Lead Library, through the Nevada Newspapers Projects, so you can read it yourself. They said, we need to diversify Southern Nevada, we need more things here. So it's been about 100 years we've been talking about this. It remains a goal. Certainly there have been steps, and I think there will be more steps, and certainly a lot of the things UNLV has done 
will help with that process, but it's not going to be easy because if it was easy, we would have done it a hundred years ago. So my last question for this section is where do we go now? Here is the picture that I'm going to contrast with that first picture, the strip pretty much empty. So what can Las Vegas be? If we're not the most connected city with 150,000 rooms filled at 92% occupancy through the year. So first of all, as somebody who's been tabbed as an expert, I'll tell you the experts probably know nothing. Did they prepare for this? Well, most people didn't. And to some extent, people we look to for expert advice actually know less than nothing because many of them are still rooted in the outdated assumptions of the world that, as it existed before March, which can be harmful to as you think for the future. So we can't really look to them. So I can't say, we'll go to this person, this expert who will tell us how to solve all the problems. I don't think that's the best approach. The good news is that there is no more pressure. Anything that happens now would be an improvement. I, I don't mean to make light of where we are now, but basically when we have a Las Vegas strip with zero hotel rooms open, zero slot machines going, zero money coming in, anything you do would be an improvement. So there's really nothing to be lost by experimenting and trying things that you wouldn't have tried a year ago. And anything might move us forward. And I would say it's impossible to fail. I mean, the, the hard part is that it's going to be very difficult to succeed, but it's easy to know that it's impossible to fail. Anything we try will gain us something, whether it's just knowledge or whether it's actual progress. That's the good news. So what happens next, looking at Las Vegas as it's been, I can see two possibilities. And this is just looking at history and trying to imagine where it's going to go. Again, I have no expertise in infectious disease whatsoever. And I would gladly defer to those folks. So as I'm seeing it, either the world stays connected and we can still fall asleep in Las Vegas and wake up in Paris, in which case this probably isn't the last health crisis because the world is going to be connected and diseases will spread quickly as COVID-19 did, in which case Las Vegas has to change or the world becomes less connected and there is a permanent dip in travel and these things are no longer as viable, in which case Las Vegas has to change. So just looking at it dispassionately, looking at it, trying to look at it through the lens of history, it seems that things are going to have to change no matter what happens in the rest of the world. We are not going to continue as we are. And, you know, I, I would like to see it another way. Nothing would make me happier than if they said, hey, there's a vaccine. We're opening up everything effective Monday and everybody's going back to work and it's going to be great. I wish that would happen. I'm not optimistic that it's going to happen like that. So the general focus I can see for Las Vegas, you know, having looked at the history, having talked to a lot of people here, having been a part of the community for many years is Going back to the basics, imagine you're in the desert, you've got to hike 10 miles, you've got to adapt quicker than it kills you. So that probably means bringing a lot of water and not going out there and hiking in the middle of the day, moving at night. Also means experimentation. That's one thing that Las Vegas has been very good. Project I'm working on, a book project I'm working on now, I've gotten to look at a lot of the entertainment history of Las Vegas, especially in the 70s and 80s. And every, when you mention entertainment in Las Vegas, what do people remember? Well, there's Frank Sinatra and the Rat Pack, there's Elvis, there's Cirque du Soleil, there's Siegfried and Roy, and we, we remember the successes. And oh yeah, that's entertainment in Las Vegas was natural. You know, pretty much everything worked. Well, looking at it, a lot of stuff didn't work. And a lot of things that they, that they rolled out that they thought were gonna work failed. But that's okay. That's why they're there. That's why you try it. Jay Sarno, who I wrote Grandissimo about, had probably my favorite quote ever. And I try to work this into every class I can because I want students to have this idea. He said he was talking about circus circus and charging for admission and sliding down the pole, which is what you had to do when it first opened. He said, well, it was a bad idea, but there are no bad ideas. It's only a bad idea after you've done it. They're all good ideas until you try them is basically what he said. They're all good ideas until you try them. And that's kind of a good place to be. 
and you see what works and whatever doesn't work, you don't do. Okay, in hospitality, looking at this, this is going to look different. And I know we have a lot of great hospitality educators here at UNLV. I think that UNLV can play a pivotal role. Certainly the Lee Prize is going to be drawing a lot of attention to what we do here. I think we can accept that in the short term, at least, it's going to look very different. There's health reasons, there's economic reasons, there will be legal reasons. The biggest physical plant of hotel rooms and convention space in the world, Las Vegas is both the most vulnerable and the one that's going to have to change the quickest. So Las Vegas is really going to be, to borrow a military metaphor, on the front line for this. And it has to be. Biggest issues that I can see, again, as somebody who looks at the history of hospitality, not as a medical professional, would be spacing. For example, how does a nightclub work with social distancing? That seems to defeat the purpose of nightclubs. How can you make that work? Um, but I can imagine that if restaurants are less dense, that experience could be improved. That experience could definitely be improved because you don't have people right on top of you. What happens to live poker games? Doesn't seem like it can exist in the way that it did. How about cleaning? Chips and cards and dice and slot machines have the potential to be pretty dirty. Okay, and germaphobes for many years were very reluctant to maybe embrace it and we can kind of see why now. And it's kind of funny, I saw a very interesting show, I believe in NBC, where they're now doing a thing where they're having little clips with TV characters and they had a great one with Monk, the detective Adrian Monk. And somebody said in the show, well, everybody is now Adrian. And it's kind of where we are and it'll be different to adapt a casino to that mentality. Again, having more cleaning is not necessarily bad for customers. I don't know many customers who will say, I refuse to play craps here. These dice are too clean. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just an adjustment. Casino floors will probably evolve to be less dense. No more big rows of slots. So I know at one time the model for the slot floor was let's have giant rows of 20 machines. That's already been going away for several years now. That was the trend. But I can really see that trend finally hitting its fruition. And, you know, we used to have rows of 20. Now we maybe have rows of six. And I could see it changing to those little pods of through two or three, like we see. And there's going to be a lot more open space. Probably fewer employees and more digital interfaces. We're probably going to see more of that. Chips, I could definitely see a situation where chips and handling chips and cash is something that only credit players do, only that the biggest players do, where other players are asked to use some kind of cashless interface, to putting money on deposit with the card, and then doing it that way as opposed to chips. I could see that working. I could even see casinos ultimately going cashless entirely. Certainly, there's a lot of good reasons to do that. Hospitality in general, I don't think is going to go away. You know, people have been traveling, people have been visiting each other and visiting exotic locations for thousands of years now. I don't think human nature is going to change, but I do think it will be different. The models we have are going to have to change. It might not be in the present scale. So are we going to get back to having 5,000 rooms full in one building? I don't know. I'll leave that to the real experts but I can foresee that that might not be happening right away, so we should adjust. In general, when we look at Las Vegas, Las Vegas really is the outlier. You know, there's not many other places you can go and have one 3,000 room hotel, let alone 20 of them. So Las Vegas is gonna be different. Doesn't mean it's bad, it just means we're gonna have to adjust. One idea that people, people talked about in the past was medical tourism. where People would come here and get medical treatment. That doesn't seem like it's the worst idea, having some kind of component in Las Vegas like that. Because we have such a big infrastructure, we can host a lot of people. We can host healthcare professionals. We can host patients. So it doesn't seem like the worst idea. You know, um, and I'm going to go back. I'm probably a little bit biased because growing up in Atlantic City, New Jersey, I was always told during World War II, the Army initiated something called Camp Boardwalk, where they took over a lot of the hotels and the boardwalk and turned them into hospitals for GIs coming back with injuries. And that's, by the way, where one of my uncles met 
one of my aunts. So I kind of had that personal family connection to it, but I always was raised with this idea that in times of, of emergency, a tourist town can step up and do something different. So I think that could work in Las Vegas. You could also have Las Vegas pivot more to research and treatment, thanks to stuff we're doing here at UNLV. There is a history of health tourism in other parts of the country. You know, going back to the spa resorts that I study with my history of casinos class in Europe, back as far back as the 17th century, their history, there's a history of people traveling for health that could come back that could come back. But really investments in research are what's going to be essential. You know, start with hospitality. Again, I think that Lee prize of a million dollars for an innovation in hospitality is brilliant. I think that's wonderful. Lee family is to be commended. And I think we can expand from there. We need to do more than react. We need to have the ability to predict the next crisis. That may mean that we get better at monitoring things, at tracking, at tracing. It may mean that we just have a better handle on how these things unfold. In any case, research is gonna be important. We also need to learn how to respond quicker so we can nip these crises in the bud. My kind of final point here is when we look now, it's easy to feel that despair. We have 150,000 empty hotel rooms, but I will end with a note of optimism. Remember Las Vegas went from nothing to a global center that you could mention in any part of the world. And those of us who've traveled know wherever you are, if you mention Las Vegas, people brighten up right away. And that means something. That wouldn't have been true 50 years ago. They would have said, oh, Las Vegas, New Mexico, that's the Las Vegas I know. And that pretty much happened overnight. And we did it on our own. We didn't have any help. Recently, there was a time where no self-respecting chef would want to go to Las Vegas where Las Vegas was viewed as a culinary desert. Now, you know, looking at those marquees in the strip, even though people aren't in them, we can see a lot of very famous chefs are here, where chefs wanna be. That's just one example. And that happened again, nobody helped us, nobody did it for us, we did it on our own. That can happen. It's not so outlandish to think that 30 years from now, people will speak of Las Vegas as a medical and science research center in the same way we talk about Las Vegas as being a culinary capital. I'm just saying as a historian, it could happen. Stranger things have happened. So I want to say thank you before we turn it over to questions and I stop sharing my screen. So again, I want to thank everybody uh, with Alumni Affairs, especially Renee, who was very patient with me as I grappled with the technology here. and. Thank you to everybody for putting this together. And thank you to all of you for taking a little bit of time out of your day and sharing it with me. I, you know, this means so much to me. I appreciate it so much. And now we will take questions and I'll stop sharing so I can see the chat. Okay, and I can now see the chat. I think, so who has questions? Okay. Taking questions now. And let me know if you see them, Renee, because I don't. Can you see the QA? I see QA. Is there anything in it? I don't see anything. All right. Okay. I see. Uh, oh, I'm scrolling down. Okay, great. Oh, wow. It's like a whole new world has been open for me. Thank you, Renee. As I said, she's been very patient with me if I, as I've struggled with the technology. Okay. Yes, so the video is being recorded. I will defer to Renee about how it could be accessed, about what you're gonna do with that. Okay, yeah, they're all good ideas until you try them. I love, I just love the wisdom of Jay Sarner. You can't see it better. Oh, wow, that's, thank you, Bernie. That's a very nice, <laughs> that's really, really sweet that, that Derek sent that out. It means a lot to me that he's a fan of the book. Um, okay, so I have a question from Ian now. What do I think about limiting flights into Las Vegas and focusing on drive-in business? That seems to be the way we're going where it seems, to, and again, I'm not a medical profession, professional, I'll leave that to them. I'm not a public health professional, I'll leave that to them. But just as someone else who's watching the news, it seems like we'll have more of a regional travel coming back before we have a national and definitely international. That seems like a good idea. 
up until the late 90s, Las Vegas really did thrive in that drive-in business. It was the proliferation of Native American gaming in California and Arizona that really cut into that. And that's what you see. So I think that would be a very good idea. I think that could definitely work. Okay, and I have to scroll up now because I got scrolled down in the chat. So let me scroll up again. So Ian's question. So I think that would be a really good place to start. If I was running a casino, I would first of all want to look at my amenities, want to look at what I have and see what works, and then figure out, okay, if I take a 300, 400 mile radius, what can I do in here that people would drive? You know, what can we do with this radius of people? What kind of capacity could we get? That would be one place I would focus. Um, question from Joy, do I foresee live events or performing arts happening? I think they will happen. I don't know what form they'll take. It seems like we're getting used to, instead of watching television shows that were made in a studio, we're watching a lot of people getting together and streaming. And I think we still have a lot of novelty around that saying, oh, well, there's, you know, an actor in their home and this is what it looks like, you know, which by the way, if that wasn't a set, um, it was a, there was a, the, that episode of Monk was really neat. Tony Shalhoub has a, has a beautiful home. If that wasn't a set, which I'm sure it was his home, very beautiful home, but it's kind of nice. I think we're getting used to this. I think we could see that. And I don't know how, Las Vegas integrates into that, whether Las Vegas is a part of it. This is another thing I've kind of thought about. Does Las Vegas kind of transcend being here physically and sort of go into the cloud and Las Vegas becomes a virtual place where people film themselves here and broadcast that? I don't know. That could happen. But, you know, I think for this, we'll see it happen. It will probably be lower density, but again, I'll leave that to the public health folks for that. Um, thank you. How locals can connect, inform ourselves, and brainstorm possible futures? I would like to think, and I'll defer to other people at UNLV, that UNLV can really play a critical role in this. You know, we're an R1 university, obviously the only one in Nevada. If this isn't the place to do it, I don't know where it is. So I could see UNLV and a lot of the great organizations we have here putting together forums, putting together things for locals to get together and to work on this. Okay. Question from John, what is most likely to disappear from the Las Vegas Strip as a result of COVID? Okay, the answer that most people want to hear, paid parking, which again, if I was running a property, I would say, well, our parking revenue is zero now. If I bring it back and it's zero, but our room revenue and our restaurant revenue is not zero, that wouldn't hurt. I could see that happening. You know, I'd like to see that happening. I've never been a fan of paid parking. I'll also say, you know, I do a lot of public and in the past three or four years, there has never, and you know, there's always time for questions afterwards. There's never been another topic that has been, has provoked as much sheer emotion as paid parking. So yeah, if that went away, that'd be happy. I could see the phase maybe not existing in the way that they've been existing. I could see that going away as well. Nightclubs is another one. Again, I'm not saying I'm predicting they'll go away. How do you make that work with everybody being six feet apart? How does that work? I don't know. Again, I didn't have the idea for nightclubs and I don't have the idea how they could evolve, but I'm sure other people do. Um, next question, thoughts on ways in which pandemic responses like spacing and hospitality may be informative for other industries like education. That's a great question from Peter Gray, who's one of our, our fantastic professors here at UNLV in the anthropology department. Hi, Peter. I think, again, Las Vegas, you know, we've called it a laboratory for so many years, but basically we have these 150,000 hotel rooms, you have these giant buildings. We can help figure out how you get people in safely and how you keep them healthy and safe. So I think that there is a lot of crossover. And I think, you know, medicine and hospitality, I know that some work in the hospitality school is already being done on this and the Harrah Hospitality College is already being done about this, but how do hospitality and medicine converge? So I think that's being done. Um, question from Leslie, where can I get the history portion, that brief history? Can I just share that part of your slides? You know, yeah, we'll share the whole talk if you're interested in more history. Okay, and Holly, I'm trying, so apparently Holly can't see the chat. I'm trying to narrate that. I hope that's good enough. Ping me again in the chat if it's not. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to repeat the questions. So Leslie, want to know the history portion, can you get more of that? Um, yeah, I can share that part of my slides. I kind of do this for a living. So 
if somebody was so inclined, I just happen to have a 15 week course. that's all about this kind of stuff, but that's a little bit of overkill. But, you know, again, if people would like to see like a little half hour snippet of history, I'd love to do that kind of stuff and make that available to the public and, you know, talk with the folks in alumni affairs about how to make that happen. Um, so Holly can't see other participants questions or ideas. Could I share? I'm not sure. And Renee, maybe you can help with that. Okay, what amount of all clear time do you, I think Las Vegas will need before people feel safe? Interesting question. And again, I'm not a psychologist. I'll just play one on our web chat here. It seems to me that Las Vegas might draw people that are predisposed to be risk takers and that risk taking and risk averse spectrum. So like, for example, I tend to be a pretty risk averse person. I think most people who like coming to Vegas are more risk embracing. So you might see people who come to Las Vegas when other people don't necessarily feel safe. So I think you'll see that as opposed to other attractions. That was a question from Bernie. I think in general, it's going to be kind of like, and this is probably a terrible analogy and there's a good reason why I don't think of analogy in the fly, but imagine if on the freeway, there was a speed trap set up. And if every time you drove past that in the, your morning commute, you saw somebody pulled over and you saw the lights going and everything, probably you would change your driving behavior. How long would it take you before you stop seeing those traffic stops every day before you decided maybe I'll push it up to 67, 70 miles an hour? That's the kind of question I think we're asking. And that's probably, we would have psychologists who would be able to answer that better. Okay, next question is from Natasha. What do I think will have happen to housing and rent prices in Las Vegas? Well, housing like everything else is supply and demand. So we've seen that demand increasing as we've come out of the recession and as we've had more of these projects, we've seen that increasing. So prices have gone up. If we can keep the economy going in Las Vegas and keep people employed, that would continue. If not, we would definitely see a decline just because there, the supply would remain the same, but the demand would fall. So again, as a homeowner here, as a community, somebody who's been in the community for decades, I would like to think that that will all continue to rise moderately, you know, not too much to price people out, but, you know, be healthy. It's hard to say. It's going to depend on what happens with the rest of the economy. Okay, next up is a question from Mike. How do I think this affects projects under construction like Circa and Resorts World? So I was thinking about this. I was driving um, downtown yesterday and I drove past Circa, which is under construction, thought about Derek Stevens and, you know, kind of thinking, well, he's really been dealt a bad hand here. Here it is, the first new project in downtown Las Vegas in this scale in decades. And here's what he gets. And I thought like, well, wait a second. You know, Derek might be able to say that he's opening the first post COVID-19 casino resort in the world. So I think he's in a good spot to make adjustments. What I like about Derek is I love his decision-making process. I love the stuff I've seen already where the parking garage and the transportation was really gonna be one of a kind because it was the first one designed with ride sharing in mind. That tells me that this is an owner and he's got a team around him that just doesn't say, well, let's look at how the last people who did it really well did it because casinos in Vegas are really effective. If you want to see a well-designed casino, I mean, you're tripping over them. You have to drive past dozens of them on your way to your, to your job site. He didn't do that. His team didn't do that. Instead, they said, how can we make it better? So I feel very confident that he and Resorts World will be able to adjust and basically create these post COVID-19 resorts. So I think that's something to celebrate. And, you know, it's not something I'm sure nobody wakes up and says, I'm really glad this is happening, but it's something to consider. Okay. Joy um, says, thank you. Las Vegas going into a virtual cloud. It's an interesting idea. Yeah, I think so. And I think it's just, how do you take the brand of Las Vegas and keep it accessible to people? And again, it's something that way smarter people than me can work on. Uh, next question is from Laura. What about technological Mecca? Is it a possibility? I think it is. I don't see it as being unreasonable. And I know there's so many things we, you know, we talk about what we need to establish ourselves as a high tech center. And while Silicon Valley does this, Boston has done that. 
Well, again, if we go back to Las Vegas, imagine that you're a cordon bleu chef in 1950 and you say, congratulations, I've graduated, I'm moving to Vegas. They would have laughed you out of the room. They said, what, how dare you? You know, it would have been like you're telling them you're putting ketchup in your steak or something like that. If you did that in 2020, they'd say, we're proud of you and we're gonna put you on our alumni website because this is a great place to be. I think that could happen. I think that could happen. I definitely see that as a possibility, Laura. I think it's just a matter of investing smartly. And again, I think UNLV has a pivotal role in this. And I think really, this is how we can give back to the community. Question from Craig, are any of my classes gonna be online? You know, I do, I have talked with the continuing ed people about doing some kind of class in the past. And I would really love to make that happen because I do this a lot and I'd love to make it accessible to people, you know, who aren't taking four credit classes. And, you know, I would say, well, just come in and audit, but that would take away from the attention I give the students who are going for a degree. But yeah, I will make a note, Craig, and reach out to online ed again and see if I, or continuing ed, continuing ed and see if I can make that happen. Cause I've really, really wanted to do that. Cause I think it'll be fun. Cause I, I love doing this stuff. Um, also from Craig may consider attracting more snowbirds and boomers monthly rentals, more RV parks. Yeah, I think RVs could be a wave of the future. And it's kind of interesting because in my research, I've kind of looked at Las Vegas and RV parks. And it's funny because in 1979, Circus Circus opened up an RV park. Caesars Palace opened up a new luxury suite tower. Because of the recession that was starting around then and lasted for a couple of years, in the short run, Circus Circus made a better decision and more people were turning to RV parks around Vegas than they were high roller suites. You know, now we've seen it swing the other way. The pendulum swings in the other direction. I think it could swing back, you know, and even I've been talking with my wife about, well, you know, maybe in June we can take a week or so and get out of town. Where would we go? Where would we stay? Well, why not? Why don't we just rent an RV? And do that, that might be the best way to do it. So I could see RVs coming back and also, yeah, Las Vegas going back to this idea of being a place where you stay for a period of time. Back in the 40s, 30s and 40s, it wasn't snowbirds, it was people coming to serve out their six weeks of residency for their divorce. And Las Vegas really was set up for that. So I could see hotels repositioning and saying, hey, we're gonna go to an extended stay model where you can stay for a month and there's less turnaround in the room. I think that would work. Um, great question from John. Beyond tourism, how significant will disruptions to the, to the convention industry be for Las Vegas? I think this is going to be really disruptive and not necessarily for the better. If we look at the Great Recession, not even going back, back that far in history, going back to the Great Recession, the thing that hurt Vegas wasn't just the leisure travelers not having a lot of money and only coming to Vegas once or twice a year instead of three or four times. It was conventions canceling. There was that huge drop. I think it was about a 25% drop in convention travel. So convention travel is really important because they fill hotels during the midweek. They also spend a lot of money all over Las Vegas, not just in on the casino floor. They have local vendors. They also go to restaurants and they tip so having that restaurant there and keeping those, having that convention there, keeping the restaurants full means that now all the restaurant employees are getting their tip income and spending that in the rest of the community. So I think tourism with conventions, business travel has been really for the past 20 or 30 years, such an important part of Vegas. That's gonna really hurt if we don't have big conventions coming back. So the question is, how do we make that happen? And again, that is when it comes to that Lee Business Prize and the other really smart people we have here. Um, question from Celine, do I think there will be more web-based jobs? I think there will be, you know, I'm noticing in my job, I can do a lot of that from home. And it's, it's a little bit of a trade-off, you know, on one hand, I like having my kids around me and the other hand, sometimes I do have to break up some squabbles, some sibling squabbles. So it's a little bit of a trade-off. It's kind of funny putting on my historian hat, my US historian hat. You know, I teach history 101, which is colonial history and 19th century history. And when we talk about labor in the colonial period in the United States, most work happened in the home. So if you were a shoemaker, you made your shoes in your home, 
you would have your apprentices who lived with you and your wife was basically your HR manager, unless you died, in which case your wife could take over the business. But if you were alive and you were married, your wife would be your HR manager and pretty much take care of that. And she would be part of the business too. So you would have married couples running their businesses together. And they used to tell my students, like, imagine how funny it would be if like, instead of being here at UNLV, you guys came over my house and, you know, we cooked food for you and we did this stuff together. And it's just a different, it was a different way of living back then. In the 19th century, work and home life became divorced. So work was something you did in factories or in offices later in the 19th century. I could see a bigger change happening where work and home start to kind of come together again. And again, I don't know if it's good or bad, but I think we be, should be prepared for that just because there's nothing written in stone saying you have to leave your house for eight hours a day to do meaningful work because it wasn't always that way. I think that's a very interesting question from Celine. And you know, I hope some historians of labor who are a little bit more immersed in this than my survey course depth could talk about that really intelligently. That's a question from Celine. I'm not seeing any more questions. Are you, Renee? Um, there were a few questions in the chat. Um, oh, okay. So there's two different sections. Um, oh, okay. And the chat. So we could probably go through a little. Let me go to chat. Okay, great. I have chat now. Awesome. Okay, so I'm going up to the front of chat. Yes. Okay. So I apologize, everyone. There's two different sections, one for Q&A and one for chat. So we can see some of those questions. Others can see um, some of those responses. So please bear with us. This is our first um, right. event using this platform. So, so, I, have great, so I, I see some of the questions were duplicated. I have a fantastic question from Mark. As someone who knows how Sarno thought, what do I think Jay Sarno would be doing now? I'm laughing because if you read the book, you know it's probably not family friendly. So that, besides that aspect of his personality, I think he would be thinking of what to build. The thing that Jay Sarno did better than anyone in Las Vegas history was to figure out something people wanted. In the 1960s, people wanted to be surrounded by glitz and luxury and wanted to be immersed in another world. The thing about going to the Flamingo or the Sands, and I'm working on a book about the Sands now, and so I'm not saying anything negative about the Sands, but if you go to the Sands, people are dressed the way they're usually dressed. Your waiters dress like a waiter, your dealers just wearing a, Sands was very progressive. The dealers would wear a regular black tie instead of a black string tie, the more Western looks. So the Sands was considered the more kind of progressive modern one because they wore a regular tie. You know, that's not what Jay saw in Vegas. Jay saw a place in Vegas where your dealers are wearing exotic costumes. The bellman is wearing a toga. You don't have cocktail waitresses. You have wine goddesses. So I think Jay, if he was around the day, would be trying to figure out what are people going to be hungry for when, and I don't want to say go back to normal because we're never going to go back the way we are. We just, when we get to where we're going next, what are people going to be hungry for and how he could provide that? So that's what I, that's what I would think about that. Okay, in the chat. Okay, classes online, great questions. Yeah, so from, Ta I think this is from Natasha, um, webinars of snippets of Vegas history. Yeah, let me talk to somebody about making that happen because I could think of a lot of platforms. I'd want to talk with everyone at UNLV and figure out the best platform for that. But if people want to see it, I, there's a few things I love doing more than this, so I'd love to do it. Okay, lost the Q&A. Okay, could see responding to Leslie's questions, could not see any other participants. Fine tweeter, who do I recommend following? Well, I mean, Ron, obviously you, I like your stuff. There's a lot of good folks who I'm totally blanking on because I don't have my screen in front of me. But I think, you know, you learn a lot from following if you just do a, you know, how I would start as I would do a hashtag Vegas search and then find the people who really resonate with you because there are a lot of people talking. You know, I find a lot of the stuff doesn't come from the experts. A lot of the best stuff in Vegas tweeting that I see is from people who just love Las Vegas. So I, that's why I love it. And it's great being able to talk with people around the world about the city and about other stuff. So that really is good. Okay, we have Martha's telepanelist. There's three dots in the control panel. If you click in it, you get the Q and A. Okay. From Peter, insights into what steps are being taken for future conventions. I would imagine that, and again, not being a public health person or even a hospitality 
operations person, although I did work in the hospitality industry, <laughs> I would say that a lot of it would come down to probably better cleanliness. You probably wouldn't see, and again, this is just me guessing, you wouldn't see the quick turnarounds we have now, you know, probably, and I'm thinking back to some of the weddings I've gone to at the Vegas wedding chapels where, you know, you come in and do, your friends do their wedding, and when you're walking out, you can see the next bride and groom are warming up in the bullpen there, and that's kind of what it feels like, you know, like, oh, they're, they're, uh, loosen enough and they're going to bring them in now. So they're warming up in the bullpen there. You know, it might be a little bit of a slower cadence than what we're used to. So I think that would be what I, that's the difference I would see there. Would be those differences in convention going down to this. Um, so I think I've got all the questions. Are there any questions I haven't answered or I haven't gotten to? And I think again, while we're looking, I just want to reiterate again, how many talented people, how many talented professionals we have here at UNLV on the staff and the faculty and certainly in the students and alumni. And, you know, if you have questions, I think this is a great place to go for answers because there's a lot of people who really know what they're doing. And I think there's great stuff is going to come out of UNLV, you know, through this crisis. you again so much for providing your insight. I think this was very helpful. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to stop recording now. So thank you all. I wish I could personally look you in the eye and convey my thanks, but I guess I'm doing that now in a web way. So thank you all. I really, I really appreciate everyone who helped put this together. It was a lot of people and I appreciate everybody for taking some time out of your day and spending it with me. So thanks a lot.